All right, guys, today we begin a new study and we will be in the book of Revelation. Sometimes considered to be a difficult book, something that's hard to understand or something that's all about the future. So we are going to try, by God's grace, to unravel as we work through, just like we always do, work through all of the wordings of the book of Revelation. We're going to work through each passage of scripture and we're going to try to unravel the meaning and what God intended for his people to receive in this wonderful, wonderful book. One of my favorite books of the Bible, to be honest with you. But before we get into dealing with the book of Revelation, we need to do a little introduction, okay? And there are basically four things that I want to talk about before we get into Revelation. Four things. Number one, what is the book of Revelations? And that's what you have to see. And sometimes you hear me say it in the plural, but actually the word revelation is in the singular. It is a single revelation. Okay. But nevertheless, nevertheless, what is revelation? Number one, that's what we're going to talk about. It is a letter. A letter simply is an epistle. That is an epistle simply is this. And, and, and you know what I'm going to do, guys? I'm going to try to take my time to thoroughly explain it. So that if you've never heard or understood these things, you can understand it. Okay, so I want to do that so that everybody can get a good understanding. And for those of you who may have a more advanced level of understanding, I have to apologize. I, we'll talk about certain advanced issues as well. But I have to apologize because I do want to break it down so that even the person who has never really understood revelation will get it so you have to bear with me in the teachings on these things okay so the point number one what is revelation it is a letter and sometimes you hear the term epistle you will see that characterized in chapters two and three of the book of revelation that is it is a, a letter that john the apostle one of the 12 apostles of jesus wrote and he wrote this letter to be given to the seven churches of the regions of John's day of Asia Minor. That's what is particularly understood in John's day, the region of Asia Minor. All right. Pretty much known. This is what we would call modern day Turkey. These were the churches in that particular area. All right. To those particular church, churches of Ephesus, of Smyrna, of Pergamum, of Thyatira, of Philadelphia, of uh, Sardis, of Laodicea, to those particular churches, all right? And this letter would be understood in the same way. Remember when the apostle Paul would write to the church of Colos, or the church in Thessalonica, or the church of Corinth, in the same way, Revelation is to be understood as a letter from the Apostle Paul that is to be circulated to the churches in those regions with a message to those churches in that day, which meant that the message was relevant. That's what you have to understand, because sometimes when we see Revelation and when we understand Revelation today, we want to think of Revelation as purely futuristic. In other words, when John wrote those letters to those seven churches, it had a relevance and a meaning, a point that God was making to those churches in that day. And what you have to understand is this now, guys, those churches no longer existed. They, they no longer exist today. So what is the point? When revelation is to be understood as a relevant message to the churches that John was writing to at that particular time. Okay. All right. So, and also another thing, what is revelation? As we commonly understand it as prophecy, we understand it as prophecy. And that is how we will be dealing with the interpretation. I don't want to get too far into that right now. The interpretation of, how to properly interpret the book of Revelation. Revelation is also prophecy because as, as John, the Lord Jesus will indicate 
to the Apostle John that it is about things to come, the things that you will see. So therefore, Revelation has a sense of prophecy. And I tell you what, I, I guess I might as well get into that right now in a manner of interpreting Revelation. And we'll move to that. When you interpret Revelation, that means when we sit down, look at the book of Revelation, how do we understand it? We understand it, number one, as a letter. That's what I was just saying to you guys earlier. It has a relevance. The message was relevant to those churches that John wrote in the past. But also we understand the message is prophetic. Prophetic in the sense that it has a relevance to us in, in this day and time. And it may even have a relevance beyond us. Even if it, that is, even if we are not alive when all of these things began to take place. So it has a future relevance as well. And that's why we mean, that's what we mean when we say revelation is also prophecy. You got it. It's also, so it's both a letter to those churches no longer existing in the past. It is prophecy. It has words to be fulfilled now and even in the future for us and maybe even beyond our time. And the third thing, revelation is also apocalyptic. Now, I just said something about interpretation that I decided not to get into right now, but I'll get into that, how to properly interpret revelation in just a second. I was thinking not to do that right now. But it is also apocalyptic. Now, when we refer to apocalyptic, okay, do you guys recall oftentimes you will see in Old Testament book, it would use a certain phrase, the day of the Lord. You'll see that in books like Joel, it is, and that particular theme is a, a, a phrase, is literally the theme of the book of Zephaniah. That's pretty much the whole idea of it. And, and pretty much that's the strength of that idea in the book of Joel as well. But the point is throughout Old Testament prophecies, you will constantly see uh, something being spoken of as the day of the Lord, even in the books of Jeremiah, you'll see it all over the prophecies. That's what we mean by apocalyptic. But now let me help you out. So by the day of the Lord, it and apocalyptic, what you're doing is you're bringing together, you're coinciding this same idea, the day of the Lord, as well as apocalyptic, because literally the word apocalyptic guys means the revealing or the unveiling. OK, that's what the word literally means in the Greek apocalypsis. All right. But the theological idea is in that revelation or revealing or unveiling that those things concerning Jesus Christ, that means concerning the appearance of Jesus. And when you say the appearance of Jesus, you simply mean his return. The things that will be involved or happening in the world as we near the return of Jesus. And that's what we mean by apocalyptic. Okay. So how is the book of revelation also apocalyptic because, and you'll see this as we move into the chapters, chapters four, Basically, chapters four through 19, that, that's what we'll be dealing with that particular part. The things that will be happening in the world as we come closer to the return of Jesus Christ. And with respect, remember, I was just telling you guys about this whole issue about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is nothing more than the judgment of God. This is about the re you remember the Paul talks about in Romans chapter two, that even now, and we see this in the past too, the wrath of God is continually being revealed. In other words, God's anger with the world because of the world's sin and rejection of Messiah is sin and rejection of God. Okay. And therefore God will judge the world. So when we deal with the day of the Lord, that basically is a period of time. It is a short period of time. And we'll talk about that later on as we get into the book of revelation. But I can tell you now 
It's the period that we call the tribulation. And if you want to be precise, you can call it what you call the great tribulation, which would be the final three and a half years of judgment. But that's premature. I don't want to get into that right now. But nevertheless, the day of the Lord is when God himself begins to bring judgment upon the world for its rejection of God, that is, and, and Messiah, Jesus, our Lord, okay? And all of this has to do, it coincides, it, co it does what? It coincides with the revelation of Jesus. And that's what's so wonderful about the book of Revelation. It deals with what? The coming of Jesus and what is God bringing upon the world, that is, the unbelieving world. He is bringing great judgment. And you'll see that when we get into the book of Revelation, as the Bible talks about certain events. And let me just, I guess I hit it prematurely. Say, for instance, the seals. The Bible is going to talk about the seals. And then later on in the book of Revelation, it's going to talk about the trumpets. And then later on, it's going to talk about the bowls. The, the, these are the, this, all of these things will be nothing more than the revelation of God's wrath on an unbelieving world for their rejection of him, rejection of Jesus, as the coming of Jesus draws closer. Okay, so let's wrap this part up. What is Revelation again? It is a letter having relevance to those seven churches in the day of John. It is prophecy, speaking also of things that will happen in the future. And future time and also it is apocalyptic speaking of how that God is bringing his wrath upon the world with coinciding with and dealing with the drawing near of Jesus his second advent into the world this is what we simply call the second coming of Jesus Christ okay all right now let's continue I want to deal with a second question why should we study the book of Revelation in the first place? As I, as I said earlier, a lot of people think it's a difficult book. It, it does have a certain degree of difficulty and interpretation and things of that nature. But nevertheless, here is the, one of the fundamental reasons for studying the book of Revelation. When we look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. So this is, and, and there's a certain sense how Deuteronomy reflects this same idea, but it doesn't state it the same way. But what I'm saying is this, this is the only book in the Bible, only book when it opens up, it tells you, you will be blessed if you read this book. Notice, there are, there, there are three things. There are three verbs that are operating in verse number three. Notice what it says. Blessed, first of all, the state of the individual, blessed. The state is blessed. If God himself says you are blessed, you are blessed. That's just the bottom line. So therefore, it is a blessing. A blessing for what? Let's look at those three verbs that are operating here. Blessed for those who read, and that simply speaks for itself, if you read the book. Then it says, blessed are those who hear. That simply means not only simply to read the book, but also to pay attention to what you are listening to, to listen with understanding. So it brings the idea of listening with understanding. And then it says, to those who heed. Heed simply means to obey. So if you read, hear, and obey the contents of this book, God says you are blessed. So therefore, why study Revelation? And even though people sometimes make it a difficult thing, I will tell you now, there are issues that you have to struggle with in studying the book of Revelation. But one thing that will come to you if you continue in this book to study it, read, hear, and obey. God himself says you will be blessed. And let me tell you something. And the reason is this. And, and, and I, I guess I'll just tell you guys now. Why? 
it speaks of the things that would be happening to the world, the condition in the world, how people will be responding to God as we move through time. And Revelation speaks of the great dangers of the judgments that will fall upon the world, the wrath of God that will come to the peoples of this world, all peoples of this world. And it constantly, what revelation constantly does for you is this. It is a warning. It is a warning to always be prepared. It is a warning to always be watchful for the return of Jesus. And think about it, guys. Isn't that exactly what Jesus said? Jesus constantly says, be watchful, be on your guard. Why? For you do not know the day that the son of man returns. Remember when Jesus said this, for if the good men of the house, if the watchmen of the house had known at what hour the thief would have come, he would have prepared himself, but he didn't know when the thief would come. What was Jesus talking about? Jesus is, was f f f looking, fashioning himself as the thief. He says, I am coming like a thief in the night. And since you don't know at what hour your Lord does come, be ready, be prepared. Don't fall asleep. Don't be like those foolish virgins who when the Lord came, they were asleep. So, and that's basically what the book of Revelation, that's why the blessing is there. Because what does it do? It helps you to remain, it helps us all remain alert. Because if you and I are looking and we are waiting for the coming of Jesus, we won't get into the mess. We won't be deceived by the world. We won't so easily fall into sin. We will become aware of our own sins and we want to make certain that if Jesus should appear at any time, we want to be able to say, I'm ready. Take me home. And notice, even though, even though I'm a little premature, as always, the very last words of John. What did John say in the book of Revelation? Even so. Come, Lord Jesus. Once he received that revelation of his return and all, he said, and come back. Come, Lord. So that's why it is a blessing and a benefit. It makes us and keeps us ready. Okay. But anyway, so that's why. Now let's get into the issue of how to study the book of Revelation, how to study. All right. I want to talk about four things. I want to talk about four things. Number one, in studying the book of Revelation, as in all of the Bible. What did I say, guys? All the Bible. Literal interpretation. What do I mean? There are degree, there are symbol, there are things about symbols in the in the book of Revelation. But let me slow it down. Literal, literal interpretation means this: take the words that God has given at its literal meaning with his literal understanding unless there is a reason to do to give it an interpretation otherwise that is a spiritual interpretation okay take the words to mean what they literally say unless according to the context that you will see in this the scriptures themselves would say there is a spiritual meaning for this so what am i saying do not spiritualize the meaning of the text. For example, just for example, Revelation chapter 20 speaks of a thousand years. It speaks of another resurrection of the dead. Notice I say another resurrection of the dead. It speaks of a, the saints reigning on thrones. It speaks of Jesus himself reigning as the king over this planet for a thousand years. In other words, take that just like it said. Don't spiritualize it. There will be another after the rapture of the church, resurrection of the dead. And I'm a little premature, but why not? I just go ahead and tell you anyway, that's the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. In other words, when King David and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, these Old Testament saints, they are not resurrected in with the church. The church we will be resurrected, receive a new body in the rapture. They will not. They will be resurrected 
at the beginning of the return of Jesus Christ. But the only thing, I don't want to get into that, but the only thing that I'm saying here is what, guys? When the scripture says something literally, take it just like that. And we will interpret the Bible. This is the proper way to do it anyway. We will interpret Revelation just like we do the rest of the Bible. Okay? Now, with respect to symbolism, since we are here with literal interpretation, there are times that Revelation uses a lot of symbolisms. Notice you, you'll see that early in the game, early in the in Revelation talks about the stars or it may use terms like the candlesticks or it's about seven spirits, things of that nature. Whenever there is spirit, uh, symbolism used in Revelation, the proper way to understand it and the rightful way to the right way to do it. A lot of times these symbols are explained sometimes in Revelation itself. So allow the book to interpret its own symbolisms. You see what I mean? That's the principle of, of, of understanding symbolisms throughout the Bible itself. Allow the symbolisms to be interpreted by Revelation. And let me make this other point too, guys. Even though, even though Revelation does not, to my knowledge, and I'm thinking about, I don't think there is not a single quote of the Old Testament in Revelation. The symbolisms, many of the symbolism, I think like over 400, maybe, I'm not certain now. Many of those symbolisms in the Old Testament are seen in the book of Revelation. What do I mean? When you find, when you come, when we come to symbols used in Revelation, John, you got to remember, who is John? John, the guy who's writing Revelation, Jesus, who's giving it to him, is a Jew, is a Jew. Their historical framework, the historical framework is the Old Testament. They're not just coming with something out of the air. So therefore, many of the symbols that we see, for example, mountain, something like that, can sometimes be understood as a king or a kingdom. We see that in the Old Testament, namely the book of Daniel. So many of the symbols that we see in Old Testament, in the book of Revelation, just go back to the Old Testament and allow the scripture to tell you to define what the meanings of those symbols are. Okay. In that way, we can get the right interpretation. So what did I just talk about? Literal interpretation. When that take the literal meaning of scripture, unless there is by the context of scripture, a reason to take a spiritual side. Okay. Then I talked about what? Symbols, how to understand symbols, allow revelation to tell you what those symbols mean. And if it's not found in revelation, allow the old Testament, the Bible itself to give you the meaning of those symbols. And with that, take that, the literal and the symbolic meaning, those symbols given, and then apply it. And that's how you understand revelation. So we've dealt with two things, literal interpretation, symbolism, and now let's deal with prophetic fulfillment, okay? Um, we're still dealing with the issue of how to study revelation. Prophetic fulfillment. Let me talk about two things. And sometimes we call these things sometimes, okay, I just break it down, slow it down. Law of double reference, okay? And I'm going to talk about the law of double fulfillment. Law of double reference. Sometimes you'll see in the scriptures, the Bible will talk about one, it'll talk about two events. That's what I call it. Double reference, double reference. Okay. It'll talk about two separate events, but the passage will have it in such a way that it seems like it's talking about one thing. Many times, for example, you will see when the Bible will talk about the first coming of Jesus and it'll talk about the second coming of Jesus in the same passage. And so what you have to be able to do is differentiate in that single passage. Say, okay, okay, I understand that right here in this part of it is talking about his first coming. Now in that part of the same passage is talking about the second coming and some, and here's the point, the reason why we call it double reference. And that passage will be separated sometimes as we can talk about the first and coming, first and second coming of Jesus, right? Over 2,000 years. So with respect to, so we have to be able to differentiate in understanding a passage. All right, here's the point. The law of double reference. How? Having the wisdom. God help us. 
understand that when a passage is speaking of a, 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 a single thing, that's the way the context will be. But it's actually two different things, and sometimes it's divided by a gap of time that can sometimes be a huge gap. So that you don't just simply read a particular passage and think it's all talking about that one thing being fulfilled right then. This was the error that the, the Jews made concerning Jesus, not being able to see how that some things he would fulfill at his first coming and then other things that is he would die for our sins. Okay, make restitutions for that. And then uh, how that he would then come to be king and ruler of the world and judge the wickedness in the world. That he would do at his second coming. Okay, that's one of the principle, idea principles we see in double reference. Now, the thing that I talk about with double recurrence, let me just deal with that. Double recurrence, and you'll sometimes see that too. Uh, for example, and I, I'm here, since we're talking about Revelation, you'll see that in Revelation 17. You'll see that also in Revelation 18. For Old Testament example, you see that in Ezekiel, what is it, 38 and 39, I believe, talking about Gog and Magog. I believe it is. But the point is this. Double recurrence simply means this. When you have one passage of scripture about one thing, and notice you'll see destruction of Babylon with respect to uh, Revelation 17, and that is ecclesiastical Babylon, that the religious Babylon. All right. And then you're going down the road to the very next chapter. And it seems like it's talking about something else. No, it's not. It's talking about the same thing, but it's speaking of it from a different perspective. And with respect to Revelation, we're talking about political Babylon, ecclesiastical. And we'll talk about all those things. The Lord permit when we get there. Ecclesiastical Babylon, the, the, the religious part of Babylon, and then the political structure of Babylon. This is what it means by double recurrence. The scriptures would talk about the same thing, maybe from possibly from two perspectives, okay, from two passive scriptures closely related together, closely back to back, back to back. All right. All right. So that's how the state of revelation. Once again, we, are, we dealt with what? Four things. Literal interpretation, how to deal with that. Take the Bible at the literal meaning. Symbolic interpretation, let the Bible define the symbols that I use. And then we apply the context. We talk about prophetic fulfillment with the sense of double reference, right? Two thing, two, something that sounds the same, but actually it's two different things separated by a great expanse of time. And double recurrence, law of recurrence for that, okay? And since I'm here, let me say this. And only one, whenever the Bible speaks of a particular prophecy, a prophecy can only be fulfilled one time. And that prophecy must be fulfilled in exactness. However the scripture says it, it must be fulfilled in that exact way. No prophecy is fulfilled more than once. Now, I understand about typologies. I understand typo okay. A typology, guys, simply means when the Bible speaks of one thing, okay, and, and it gives, and that one thing is a shadow that speaks of something greater. For example, when Jesus says, even as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for what, three days and three nights, so in this manner, the Son of Man, speaking of himself, I'll be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, speaking of his death and then his resurrection. This is what you call a type, a type or a typology. But nevertheless, even though one situation spoke of another, that is Jonah, Jonah's being in the belly of the great fish. All right. That was not so much Jesus fulfillment. Jesus, what Jesus went through was a greater and singular fulfillment of his death and resurrection, okay? John, what Jonah went through was simply a type, a shadow of that, all right? So the whole point, and I want to get into all of that. Scripture, whenever there's prophecy, it can only be fulfilled once, and prophecy must be fulfilled in totality, exactly like it was written. So you can only have one fulfillment, all right? Now, let's talk about understanding revelation 
by the divisions. I understand it. All right. Our final point on this. And so we'll go to verse number 19, chapter one, verse 19, to help us understand revelation. And notice what it says from the mouth of our Lord to John. And we'll talk about that. I, I'm just cutting it short when I say to John, because the word came from, and we'll see that in the text, from God to Jesus, to an angel, to John, ultimately to be given to the church. But I just sometimes, sometimes say to John. What does verse 19 say? Therefore, as Jesus says, write the things which you have seen that's in the past. Okay. The things which are, those are things in the present and the things which will take place after these things. So Jesus said to John, write the things from that you have seen in the what? The past, the present, and the future. And that's how we can understand and study the book of Revelation. The things which John saw in the past. That's basically what you'll see in chapter one. All right. And that's basically is the glory of the resurrected and exalted son of God. That that is the things of the past. That's how you see it. Chapter one. And then it says the things that will be present. That is present from the perspective of John. From the perspective of what John as Jesus is speaking to him. And that will be chapters two and three. The letters to the seven churches. But we also understand that there is a prophetic sense of those letters. And we'll, and once I get into those letters in chapters two and three, I'm not going to discuss it now. I'll tell you how to understand the letters even from our day because it has relevance to our time as well. Okay. But the point is past chapter one, present from John chapters two and three. And the future from the perspective of John, chapters 4 to chapters 22. And so that's the division. Those are the three divisions of Revelation. Chapter 1, chapters 2 and 3, chapter 4 through 19. 1 is the past, 2 and 3 is the present, 4 through 22 is the future. Okay, And these things from the perspective as Jesus was giving them at that time to John. All right, guys, I know that was kind of a long introduction, but you know what? i tell you what, go back because still there's a, that's a lot of information, things to absorb that I was talking about in the introduction to Revelation. And oftentimes, here's where we make mistakes. We, we want to get into a book without preparing ourselves for the study of the book. In understanding those things that I discussed earlier in this introduction, it will help you as you work your way through the book of Revelation. As I said before, Revelation, it, to be honest, it ain't the easiest book in the world to understand, but I still believe God does not give a book, give his word that we cannot understand. Therefore, it can be understood and it can be understood rightly, but it takes work and we have to do our part in understanding the book. Remember what the, who was it? The, the Bible said that the things that are given to us are for us and for the sons of men, but the things that are kept secret are for God alone. What is my point? If God has given his word, it is for us to understand and it is for us to apply it to our lives. So we pray like the writer said, like the God said in verse number three, we pray for a blessing to you as we work our way through the book of Revelation and hang with me guys. I know it'll be a blessing to you if you stay with it. All right guys, see you next time. Have you subscribed yet? What are you waiting for? Subscribe now.